Professor Vic Perry and um, Ulla Spust and uh, Lars Carlson and Katrin Hasselgren for making this possible. Uh, but I want to tell you uh, a lot about uh, what we do. So uh, I will go through the slides if I go too quickly and uh, you want to discuss a point, uh, you can uh, talk to me uh, later at the break. So about two years ago, we got this uh, uh, grant from NIH, which is called Illuminating the Druggable Genome. And the purpose of it is to essentially try to map every single interaction and information data point that we have about proteins and try to link it with diseases and uh, everything else in the quest of finding new uh, biological function for uh, diseases. And it's a multi-center collaboration. We collaborate with people in, in Denmark. We collaborate with uh, EMBL. Uh, Anne Hersey is here, so she will talk later about what they're doing. Uh, we're doing ontologies with Stefan Schurer, uh, NCATS uh, at NIH. They help us develop uh, uh, the uh, portal, which is called Pharos. And uh, we collaborate a lot with the genomics team of Avi Mayan uh, and uh, Joel Dudley, who is working on drug repurposing. And we also are supported by seven different uh, teams that do uh, experiments. Uh, there are two teams at the University of North Carolina, uh, four, as it turns out, at UCSF, and then Yale, Baylor, and, and Harvard. Uh, so why are we caring about all this? It's because we're trying to develop new drugs for new targets. And the question what the drug target is, is pretty important. The strictest and simplest definition is that you need a material entity that has a mass. And it leads to a clinical effect. Without that, so if, it's a, if it doesn't have a mass, meaning it's a pathway, a pathway is not a drug target. You still have to interact with the physical object. So uh, we try to put that into account, and by doing that, we come up with uh, four different categories for uh, these drug targets. The one that we put the most work on is what we call T-Clin, and that's where we know that the drugs are associated with clear mechanism of action. And there's a paper that is uh, in final stages of preparation with the EBI team and, and UNM, where we are uh, coming up with all these annotations. We also have another way to look at it, which is asking the question, how many of these proteins interact with small molecules? And we call that category T-chem, and we use some cutoff values. So for kinases, for instance, we use uh, 30 nanomolar, partly because of selectivity. GPCRs, nuclear receptors, they're slightly uh, different cutoffs. Ion channels, they have less affinity. Uh, so to capture the drugs that are on the market, like lidocaine, uh, you really need to go uh, high in, in the affinity. And in general, when we don't have a lot of information, we put uh, one uh, micromolar. Another category, uh, which is the vast majority of the proteins, is what we call T-bio. And in T-bio, we do not have small molecules, uh, but we know a lot about them. So there is publications, there is antibodies that are available, etc. We also have uh, uh, gene ontology uh, terms, in particular, uh, if they have a biological process with an experimental code, we consider it uh, part of T-Bio. Also, if it has a validated, uh, confirmed omim phenotype, so it has to have two publications in uh, omim. And then the last category is the ignorome, or T-Dark. And T-Dark basically says we don't have a lot of publications, we don't have a lot of uh, reference into function. This is like Twitter. It's maintained by NCBI, but it basically describes uh, gene functions. Also, we do not have antibodies. And we got permission from uh, Matthias Ulen uh, to use the antibodypedia.com data. So this is how the human proteome looks like. This is 20,000 proteins. Uh, about 37% uh, of them are in what we call uh, T-dark which is uh, the enigmatic genome. We do not have a lot of information. Uh, most of pharmacology and biochemistry ends up in this corner here. This is uh, drugs, this is uh, small molecules. And then the rest are uh, proteins for which we, we might have ligands, but they're not very selective and they're not very potent. So uh, the majority of them lack ligands. So they're in, in T-bio. So the take home message from this part of the talk is that about 3% of the human proteome is targeted by approved drugs. 
We also have, and I did not show you the data, but uh, when you look at disease annotation, about half of them have uh, significant disease annotations. So there is a lot of room to develop new drug targets. And about 6% of the proteins have small molecules. Uh, so in total, less than 10% of uh, the proteome is manipulated by small molecules. So a lot of work that needs to be done in chemical biology, medicinal chemistry, pharmaceutical bioinformatics, however you call it, there's a lot of work to be done. I want to tell you a little bit about a resource that we've developed. It's called Drug Central. And uh, primarily it's work done by Oleg Ursu. I started this uh, about eight years ago. And everyone uses Drug Bank, and I think Drug Bank is a great resource. And other people use uh, Keg uh, Drug, and that's also a great resource. But what was missing until I found out today, uh, there is also efforts from Keg into that, is to map uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients into the pharmaceutical products. And there is a website called DailyMed, uh, which is maintained by NIH. And, uh, in DailyMed, you can map all these uh, drug labels. So we extract it uh, with controlled vocabularies, indications, contraindications, uh, dose of route of administration, uh, pharmacological classes, and all these uh, properties. Then we also map to targets, as I mentioned, through the uh, proteome work. This allows us to give this type of information. So uh, you all know that capitalism is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the economic uh, system that, that drives the world at the moment. But in the pharmacy, it is quite brutal. And this applies uh, in the United States. So these are all formulations of acetaminophen or paracetamol, as it, it's called. And if you look at paracetamol, acetaminophen, there's more than 4,000 uh, drug combinations that contain this in the pharmacy in the US. So they all have package inserts. And they vary in price, so uh, this formulation, which is for menstrual relief, costs about three times as much as the generic uh, Tylenol. And it has the exact same ingredient, the exact same uh, dosage. And when you look at this, it's over-the-counter medications. So these are active pharmaceutical greens, this is FDA approved, uh, and those are human prescription medicines. But when you look at the number of drug labels, they're almost one-to-one. -one. So it's literally, uh, all this is because you can combine them in multiple ways and you control the prices. And this is not something that only happens in the US. It happens in Australia as well. This uh, came out, uh, uh, I think, in BBC News uh, a few, uh, about a month ago. So it's a pharma uh, company in the UK called Rankin Bakeser. They uh, own this uh, brand called Neurofen. And they were literally caught red-handed that they market the same product with multiple names. So it contains ibuprofen, uh, but they have uh, prices varying four times as much. So this happens all the time. It's not just a US uh, phenomenon. The other way to ask questions is to say, OK, we now have all the drugs. How many diseases can we treat with these drugs? And it's not to cure, but to treat, meaning it's an indication. So. You're looking at unique disease concepts. It's roughly about 2,000 diseases. And you look at the off-label diseases, and that's a, about uh, 900. And unique and in total, it's about 2,500 diseases for which we have drugs that have own indication. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is to ask the question, how many drugs are uniquely addressing these? So uh, I try to keep that separate because it's all very confusing. Uh, we also uh, target biologics, so insulin and all these other uh, protein uh, peptide-based drugs, uh, they're also captured in this uh, analysis. So the second take-home message is that about 70% of the diseases lack therapeutic agents, maybe more. And the reason we don't, I cannot give you an exact number is that we use this system, uh, it's a project uh, from Lynn Schrimmel at the University of Maryland, uh, disease ontology. And they, uh, in their most recent paper, they look at about uh, 9,000 diseases. But we already know that there are about 7,000 rare diseases which are not captured here. Um, Andreas Bender mentioned rare diseases earlier. About 6,000 of those are not captured into the system. So we think there may be as many as 15,000 diseases in total. So that's why I cannot give you an exact number. One thing that always interests me is financial uh, aspects. 
So the source of data, there's two sources of data. They're both public domain, so you can uh, download the data and mine it yourselves. One of them is the data from Medicare. Uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, which you might know as Obamacare, uh, the uh, Medicaid has decided to release data into the public domain. And this data contains all the prescriptions made by physicians in fiscal year 2013. It contains about 1.2 billion prescriptions and uh, reimbursements were made to the tune of $75 billion. And we map those to targets because everybody looks at drugs. I thought it's time to look at something different. The other source of data we use is called NIH Reporter, and that allows you to ask the question how much money goes in R01s. R01 is the most uh, typical research uh, grant that you get from NIH. So this pie chart shows drugs, but also uh, target names. So the most lucrative target in 2013 was the target for uh, Lipitor and Crestor, which is uh, HMG coeriductase. Insulin was the second largest. So you think about it, these are statins, you know, cholesterol lowering drugs, then diabetes, uh, ulcer, uh, inflammation and uh, asthma, COPD. Uh, these two relate to schizophrenia and, uh, uh, yeah, that's pain, uh, the opioid receptor. So all these illustrate the patterns of Americans that are age 65 or older because Medicare is data that only applies to those uh, type of patients. And you see the characteristic. Uh, uh. The other way to look at the data is to ask, how much uh, is the data, how much is the target being prescribed? So we're looking now at uh, the number of claims. And this is, of course, takes the money out of the equation because sometimes uh, the cheapest uh, drugs are prescribed the most. You still have the HMG core reactase as, as the top one, but then you switch to, these two are used for high blood pressure. So this is the adrenergic beta-1 uh, receptor, and this is the angiotensin-converting enzyme. Then you go back to the proton pump and the opioid receptor. Uh, that's a uh, transporter uh, uh, for um, depression. Then you go to a calcium channel blocker. That's, again, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, surprising, at least to me, was to see this uh, thyroid receptor agonist. So tyroxine and levothyroxine are uh, prescribed about 40 million times. And upon talking to physicians, it, it turns out that about 20% of Americans age 65 or later have thyroid problems. So that kind of pattern will show up in this analysis. But I want to go back to the ignorant because I still want to find out who funds type of research that uh, uh, tells us about the dark genome, yeah, the dark matter. And I lifted uh, this site, the, these quotations from a paper from uh, Pande and co-workers in PLOS One. I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, you can look at the paper. But they essentially asked the question whether this ignorome is due to social patterns of research or do these genes have unusual biological properties. And my answer is that it's most likely going to be related to social patterns of research. So we're looking at the R01 funding. This is now uh, targeting T-Clean, T-Chem, T-Bio, and T-Dark. And in the T-Dark analysis, I excluded 88% because of the numbers were 0, 0, 0. So there is no funding for all those. And then what you can see is that the median funding for a T-Clean target is about $2 million compared to $90,000 for the 10% uh, or so of the T-Dark targets. So, quite literally, the ignorome is uh, severely underfunded. They're not even on the graph. And, of course, the idea is that as you progress this way, you get more money. So, another take-home message is that the social patterns of research win. Uh, if you want to get money from NIH, you're more likely to get it if you come with a proposal that is on a drug target. Also interesting to me, at least, is that only 20 of the 600 or more drug targets that uh, are annotated with mode of action account for uh, almost two-thirds of the money that was reimbursed in 2013. So if you want to work on a high-risk, low-funded area of research, you're probably not going to get your money from NIH. You'll have to go to a foundation or you'll have to divert the money. Another way to analyze the data from the CMS 
is to ask the question, uh, how much uh, do these drugs cost? So these are the studies that were reimbursed. And the winner is AstraZeneca's drug called Crestor, which uh, in 2013 earned them about $2 billion. At the time, Lipitor was still on patent. So the patent expired in 2013. So Lipitor was on patent, so they still wrecked, Pfizer wrecked about $1 billion. The rest are drugs that are already off patent. So then, with this type of data in mind, we can ask the question, how effective are these uh, drugs? And we extracted uh, data from a database which is called Cerner Health Facts, which has uh, 62 million patients. And then we asked the question, what is the mean cholesterol, the median actually, cholesterol value in milligrams per deciliter? These are measured from patients for the patients that were taking each drug. So the winner in the best lowering cholesterol is Crestor, uh, which has, it lowers it to about uh, 80. The second one in terms of lowering is simvastatin, which goes to 87. I should point out that anything below 120 is considered a success clinically. So all of them work in the clinic, okay? But if you look at the affinity, there's no relationship. Lipitor is the second most potent, but it's not the, the second when it comes to, to lowering the cholesterol. So in the clinic, what you see is not related directly to what you see in, in, in vitro. But the other way to ask the question is, how much do these cost per claim? So if you ask how many patients got the drug and how much money did it cost to get it, then Crestor costs about 243 per prescription. Uh, Lipitor is about 35 and Sivastatin is $15. So if you go back to this slide, the second best in terms of lowering cholesterol costs $15 compared to Crestor, which costs $240. So you do the math, okay? This is a financial question. You can also ask the question, well, maybe one of the drugs has better side effects. And the answer is yes. Uh, if you look at Crestor, it does not have uh, uh, rhabdomyolysis as, as much as the others. It, it still is reported, but not as much. But the other ones also report drug ineffective at number four for pravastatin. Sivastatin is drug ineffective number five, which is roughly 10%. And uh, Lipitor is maybe at uh, 7%. And this is data from uh, the FDA. So there is an open FDA project that we can mine the data. So I think it's time to look at clinical efficacy. You can take data from patients and measure it. If you have a clear clinical biomarker, such as cholesterol lowering drugs, you can also do this with diabetes, for instance. You can look at glucose. There are other drugs for which this can be done. And then you can ask the question, how much does it cost? Do these adverse event profiles, do they uh, help you decide which one to reimburse and how much is the cost to society? Uh, another topic that I want to talk about is drug-drug interactions. And we have developed in our lab uh, a way to uh, look at mixture similarity where we encode uh, similar with what Andreas were talking about, which is the chemical fingerprints. And then encoding from the fingerprints and the molar values for these, uh, uh, if you want, molecules, we can get a very specific fingerprint that is uh, valid for that particular formulation. So a combination of uh, 400 milligrams of this and uh, 200 milligrams for, from that will have a different uh, fingerprint compared to the one that has 50 milligrams versus uh, 500 milligrams. So each vector print is for a specific uh, drug formulation. But in this particular case, uh, when you calculate similarity, which we can do using Tanimoto coefficients, these two are quite similar in terms of formulation. So we use this type of uh, method to uh, develop a model where we make the hypothesis that you can take these multiple API formulations, which we call drug-drug combinations. So there are about 3,700, a bit more, uh, approved fixed dose drug combinations by the FDA. And those we consider to be positive drug combinations. At the opposite end, we have all these drug-drug interactions which everybody considers to be detrimental. And these are sources of data that we've taken for drug-drug uh, interactions. So we roughly have about uh, 17,000 drug-drug uh, interactions which are uh, manually curated. And those are the sources, uh, VA, uh, Stockley's, and Lexicomp. And then we also look at the drug-drug combinations because those help us inform what drug combinations are allowed. 
And so far we've captured about uh, 2,000 of them. But we've also, because of this Health Facts database, we recently got our hands into what's called co-prescription medication, which means lots of patients get drugs. They're not combined by the FDA, but they're combined by doctors. And we have criteria, so you have to have multiple prescriptions. The patient gets to be discharged, so there are net, no death codes. So in other words, they're not lethal. And then we take that type of information and we're slowly creating a, a compilation of co-prescriptions. On the interaction type, we look at multiple things. Primarily, we look at uh, P450 substrate inhibitor, substrate inducer interactions, and at uh, PGP, substrate inhibitor and substrate inducer interactions. And of course, uh, all these are interactions that are caused by, so one drug is a substrate, the other one's an inhibitor or an inducer. So all these are caused in humans, right? And these are some of the interactions we take. And so what we get is roughly uh, a machine learning model. Uh, this is just a plot on, in a three-dimensional space. Uh, the Q square for that is potentially relevant. We have 10 PLS components, but the problem is, of course, that the, the system is skewed. And the reason it's skewed is because we can't help it. We have more negative interactions than positive interactions. So when it will come to predict something, uh, even though we use all the statistical checks and balances, we will still tend to predict or over predict negative interactions. So we're not yet happy to this, which is why we haven't published, but we're actually working on taking this uh, Cerner health facts. So soon enough, we will have more of these positive drug combinations. And we developed a, an app where you can submit a combination of uh, drugs. So you can put in either the drug name or the smile string, and you can put uh, the amount in milligrams, and then it converts it to, to molar values. And then it will tell you, if it knows about it, it tells you that it's true, that it found it, and then it tells you it's negative. So if it's a negative interaction, it's in red. If it's an approved combination and it's safe, it's in green. We also had to train the model to say, hey, I don't know. So if I don't know something, I don't put a label. And that's an important distinction because we don't make a prediction just for the sake of predicting. So I think machine learning can be used to predict drug-drug interactions. And a lot of the, like Thomson writers and micromedics, they use text mining. I think it's time to move beyond text mining. I also want to tell you a little bit about a tool that we developed which is uh, on a website called newdrugtargets.org. And uh, it takes data from text mining. So Lars Jensen in the University of Copenhagen, um, we take his data uh, to ask two questions, or we have two hypotheses. One is that if a target is mentioned in many abstracts with a disease, then it's quite likely that there is a specific link between that target and that disease. So for example, you have 10,000 papers with insulin and 10,000 papers with diabetes. And if 9,000 of those papers are the same, then the signal it is strong that insulin and diabetes are correlated. If the overlap between them is zero, then we don't make any link between uh, diabetes and insulin. The second hypothesis is that the more papers you have about something, the less novel it is. And the less number of publications you have, the more novel and less understood it is. So we compute a novelty score and we compute a uh, fractional disease target relevance score. And I will skip this slide, but essentially uh, these are the simple criteria we use for the fractional disease score and the novelty. And if you go to newdrugtargets.org, this is live. Uh, you can query it right now. Uh, you can come up and pick a disease. Uh, so the diseases are organized according to the disease ontology. and Knowledge goes that way, so the more you know about something, the less novel it is, it goes that way. And uh, the more validated the target it is, in other words, the more important it is, the relationship between that disease and that target, the more it migrates in the upper direction. So the high-risk targets are on this uh, level. So just to give you a simple example, if you pick on a, a dot in the top uh, left corner, uh, say you pick something called the hematologic cancer, and then one of the most relevant targets is Abelson kinase, which of course makes sense, Philadelphia chromosome, uh, Gleevec, etc. And then as you migrate with your scroller, uh, you scroll with the mouse and then you find something called P2RY8. And then you ask the question, is this relevant? And if you click on it, 
it will shade uh, the rest of the screen and it will start to show you uh, text about a disease as well as the publications that uh, claim the relevance of that interaction. And if you take actually uh, click on that, it will give you the abstract or you can go straight to PubMed and read it for yourself. So this is a tool that should encourage you to explore new associations. So if you have a hypothesis, you can play with this system and then you decide for yourself, do I want to work on this target or not in cancer? So we think we have a new way to identify uh, disease target associations. And then last but not least, I want to tell you about machine learning models that we're doing uh, together with uh, the group of Klaus Robert Miller at the Technical University in Berlin. So this is all the expression data from multiple sources about uh, uh, three high throughput experiments as well as uh, all the literature, uh, so text mining. And then uh, all this expression data is converted into vectors and these vectors are submitted to PCA and that PCA is then uh, looking at the covariance matrix, it looks like this. And then we asked uh, the group in Germany to come up with a single class SVM model. So the only target class that we really know something about is Ticlin. Those are the best uh, targets, they're the druggable targets because we know there are drugs that work uh, that are in the clinic. So we then asked the question, can you build a model that will help you uh, inform out of the other uh, 19,000 proteins which ones are more likely to be similar to Ticlin. So we look for druggability based on expression patterns. And this uh, is then a 2D plot out of the uh, 50 PCA, uh, 50 dimensions PCA model. We already can tell that there is some very strange uh, neighborhood effects. Uh, that has to do primarily uh, with uh, the fact that there are some uh, proteins for which expression data is simply lacking. And there are some proteins for which there's lots of expression data. So those are here and then some of those that have poor data are discriminated against. But then, more importantly, we're looking at cluster effects. So this is now a, a stochastic neighborhood embedding system where we then ask the question, can you tell me out of the dark which ones I should look at to try to prioritize? So this is where we're going with this. We're, we're going to look at this edge similarity and say, um, of all the 8,000 uh, proteins in the dark, can we then find which ones to, to hunt, to prioritize? And for example, and I don't have the slides, we're working with the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium, uh, which has uh, 18 sites that do mouse knockouts um, in, on four continents, and they get funding from five national or international funding agencies. So it's a really huge project. And we're working with them to give them a priority list to, to come up with new targets. So I think we can use machine learning uh, to find more druggable targets. And most of the things I talked about, uh, including uh, TNX, uh, you can access them at the FAROS uh, site at NIH. Uh, my vision for the future is that we will have all this data coming out in uh, like a TV station with uh, three languages. One language for physicians, one language for biologists, and one language for chemists. The data behind it is the same, but the way you mine it is different. And then, of course, because of Google, we have to put a single line search system. So that's the, the effect of today. So essentially, you type in something here, it will recognize whether it's a disease or a drug or a target, and then it will take you to it. So I encourage you to visit this. Again, that's the most developed uh, aspect of our research. And this I put for Yale. Uh, we don't do pharmaceutical bioinformatics. We do translational informatics. And uh, I think the goals are the same, but we come from it from a different angle. We mine uh, papers, we mine patents, uh, together with uh, Anne Hersey. So Anne leads a group at uh, EBI that uh, hunts and associates targets to patents, to chemical structures in a project called Sure Campbell, which she will probably tell you about. So we take the patent data, we take the patient data and the publications, and then we try to map it to proteins, diseases, and drugs. And uh, that's our website. So thank you for your attention.